A good life is an obstacle course, a life where you are up leveling 100% with total certainty is an obstacle course. But it's like I just had to experience the complete unraveling of myself, being torn in a million places, feeling busier than I want to feel, holding all the plates in the air. And as much as I have acknowledged that that is a problem, like this event that took me kind of over the edge of it gave it airtime. It made me listen to it. It made me think, where to next? Maybe this means I have to quit my medical job. That emotional activation is key to being able to bring up those old memories, bring them up and prompt them. And the emotional activation is the thing that gives you a chance to change them. Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Dr. Beck. And I am Christine Barker. And this is Am I Doing It Wrong? A podcast for doctors by doctors. Dr. Beck is a mindset coach and medical doctor who specializes in liberating driven professional women from the limitations of perfectionism, imposter syndrome, and people pleasing. She's basically the cheat code for getting out of your own way, showing up authentically, and living a life you're proud of. And Christine is a medical educator and nephrologist who creates resources for doctors in training that I truly think are an unfair advantage. She makes complex topics super simple and takes the pain and uncertainty out of passing your medical exams. Christine and I connected a few years ago via our online platforms and over the years we've discussed countless highs, lows and in-betweens of Dr. Life. And in doing so, we've experienced firsthand the power of vulnerable conversations to show us where we get in our own way and underestimating our capacity. So we want you to be part of the conversation and experience these same results. Every week on the pod, we'll be bringing you conversations which shine light in dark places, normalize the doctor journey, ease unnecessary suffering, and give you actionable steps to thrive in all facets of your life. So grab a cuppa and get cozy for this week's episode of Am I Doing It Wrong? The podcast for doctors by doctors. Hello everybody and welcome back to the podcast. Would you believe it? This is episode 53, which means we have published a whole year's worth of weekly episodes for you guys that we so hope you are enjoying. We really think that we filled a space here that we really need in medicine where people are being more vulnerable, more authentic, more honest and hopefully encouraging this to become more of a norm in our culture that we talk about the hard stuff and um we didn't have that we haven't found this space anywhere else on the internet and um so we're really excited to have 52 weeks one year worth of podcasts for you guys it's been an absolute blast and thank you so much just for being here it's been super fun and I guess I'm really excited to see where we go with the podcast we've got new branding as well we've got a new thumbnail (laughs) we're growing the potty is growing and we're growing with it and yeah I'm just excited to see what's next actually on that note there are Australian podcast awards coming up and you can actually vote for our podcast am I doing it wrong for doctors by doctors if you go to the website we'll put it in the link down below we would just love it if you guys gave us a vote if you found this podcast helpful to you because we would just love to see that you get out to more and more people we're already so excited that it's resonating with people not only in Australia where we work but also uh, largely in America and off to Europe and Asia and all kinds of different places so I think the physician physician experience is very um very well shared worldwide and we would just love for more people to join our community and we'd love for you guys to also have the benefits of having the community kind of converge on this space that is a podcast. So if the podcast has been helpful to you, we would absolutely be honoured to have your vote there. Oh, thank you so much in advance, Dr. Humans. So onwards, we are doing today's episode on, of course, another vulnerable topic. It's come about because Christine and I have been in it. Like I'm telling you guys, there have been some tears (laughs) over the last couple of weeks tears between productivity and then more tears and then more productivity. And the reason we want to talk about this today is because it is very easy to feel like when you're down and out on your bedroom floor crying that everything is truly going wrong, that something is going very terribly wrong for you to be in that position. And the first thing we want to share is that 
the both of us have been in that position multiple times in and out over the past couple of weeks, maybe months, I suppose, solid. And we're coming to you today from the other side of that, from coming out of me, I'm still a bit in it. I'm definitely, I'm still in a a growing phase right now, but we're going to focus on Christine today because she's come out the other side and she's now reaping all of the rewards of continuing, persisting through that struggle and gaining all of the insights, the wisdom, the skills that you get from persisting through those challenges. And that's exactly what we want to talk about today because I say that a good life is an obstacle course and certainly a life where you're continuously growing, that will be an obstacle course, not a joy ride by any means. And I think, you know, that sentiment people probably understand intellectually, but I really want you to ask yourself what your last experience was like when you were on your bedroom floor or in the hospital corridor, bathroom, residence room, crying. In that moment, were you in that growth mindset or were you truly believing that something very, very bad is happening and that everything's going wrong? For most of us, that's the place we end up in. And so we want to bring you this message today as a reminder to help change your relationship with these periods in your life where it's really hard, which is so common for doctors. It's so common for us to be in on our bedroom floor crying type situations when everything feels really dark. It's really common. You might not see that in your colleagues because we're all, you know, at the same time, very professional. And so we, um, we manage our emotions in different ways, some more healthy than others, in my opinion, but we, we don't often see it on the surface and it's something that we often go through by ourselves. And I think that that, um, that the, the way that we do that in private and that we often don't open up to other people in our experience of this can actually compound the problem. It can ha- actually help to reinforce that, you know, not only not hearing other people going through the same thing, but when we choose to hide it, and we are therefore saying that it's something worth hiding, something that's not safe to share, we are in ourselves reinforcing that idea that it's perhaps something to be ashamed of. But that's what we're here for on the potty. So a good life is an obstacle course, a life where you are up leveling 100% with total certainty is an obstacle course. And we want to talk through this example that Christine's got today of how all of the challenges, all of the tears that came with this time, when we actually reflect on what was happening, we can see that that was a necessary process, an absolutely necessary part of, of actually growing. And that without those struggles, she wouldn't have been able to grow. Without those struggles, what she has now, she would have never gotten. It wouldn't have been available to her. And I think the best way to do that is to send this message with a tangible, specific, relatable story. And we want you guys to reflect on in your life where, you know, so firstly, one thing to reflect on as you're listening to this episode is how perhaps you're you're in a good place right now, but maybe look at a recent time where life was hard and then reflecting on what that hard time gave you. But in particular, we're sending our hearts out today to anybody who's in it right now, to anybody who is in the tears on the bedroom floor mode right now, and to give your brain a little bit of space to step back and look at the big picture and look at what this might be offering you so that you can decide, do I want to continue on this path? as Christine has, to get what's on the other side? Or do I want to exit? Exiting is always an option, but we want to recognize what we're gaining and giving up in the exit. So Christine, without further ado, tell us about what's been going on. Oh my goodness, the obstacle course. That's such a great analogy for life. And I almost feel like it's, it's, 
I hopefully will make it a long story. And for those of you who've been listening, you'll recognize various parts of this weaved into the recent few months because it really has been real. And it's been, I knew I was in a season of shifting and changing and I knew or growth even, and (laughs) it didn't make it any less uncomfortable, but it's really been, like you say, there were tears. I, I literally fell apart. And then only from that place was I able to then get to the other side and have what I was actually wanting the whole time. So I guess just to give it context, so I'm a medical doctor, but I also have an education business, which means that I run courses and programs. I build them, I run them. You know, there's like stresses attached to that, but it's such a beautiful thing. Um, I've got YouTube, I've got this podcast, and then I also have my clinical work. And so for many years, like as far back as I can remember, as my business has been growing and it's really that's like feels like my passion, like that, that makes me so happy. I also love being a doctor. But what was happening is I was having this real tension between my business and then my clinical work. And I had so much resistance to it. Every time I had to go into clinic, it was like I was a kid happily playing in a sand pit and someone had come and extracted me from the sand pit and I had to go into clinical work. It was dramatic internally. Obviously, I wasn't like that on the outside, but it was such an uphill battle to shift my focus between the two worlds. And so I had a lot of kind of resistance to being there. I felt like I wasn't present half the time, but I also wasn't liking that because I wasn't liking the way I was showing up. So that was sort of the background baseline level of discomfort that I really wanted to get rid of. And I got to an interface where I was thinking, you know, does that mean I'm not supposed to be doing clinical anymore? Should I quit that? Should I, where am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to be doing? And it was a real dilemma, but I just knew it didn't feel good. And I wanted it that, that bad feeling to end. And then my business continued to grow and grow and grow, which is so lovely. (laughs) So grateful for it. Thank you for growing. But then with that, it just, the problem just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I reached a critical mass where I was like, okay, I need to hire someone. That'll be my savior. I'll hire someone and I'll get help. And so I hired a virtual assistant and this is nothing to do with the virtual assistant at all. This is all, especially when you look back, this is all Christine stuff. But what I found in hiring a virtual assistant is that it, you know, my expectation was that I would hire this person and they would be like a clone of me and I could just delegate things and life would be better. (laughs) And what happened was I had to train this person. So then I became not just Christine, but I became a CEO boss lady slash this person's manager slash this person's work organizer because I had to like think of all the things to do and then communicate all the things to do (laughs) it just became this whole thing supervising the whole process so then I had more work to do it felt like so I had created more problems for myself and I was kind of losing my mind and whilst this is all about my business and everything I'm just if if you're sort of listening to this and you don't have a business I just want you to think about times where you really overstretched yourself You said yes too many times. You get too many like plates in the air and you're worried they're all going to fall over. Like I'm sure you can relate to that on some level, but this was super my business. So I hire help and then I realize I'm busier than ever. Then I go to the Gold Coast um, thinking I'm going to have my five days of relaxation and I'm going to reset myself and I'm going to be able to deal with everything that's currently in my life. <laughs> couldn't have been farther from the truth. It was not five days of relaxation at all. I just, I couldn't get away from myself. Everywhere you go, there you are. It wasn't, it didn't do what I thought it would do. So my nervous system is still not rejuvenated. And I come back and we recorded an episode about that, about how I decided that when I got back from the Gold Coast and my life was just like it was, and I was wanting something different, I set myself the intention that I must answer the question how do I live a life that I don't need a holiday from? And so that happened just a few weeks ago, really. Um, and I, <laughs> that was the thing that I was on a mission because I was like, I've had enough. I've had enough. I cannot do this. And then so I started living my life through that question. And then things did get more fulfilling like what I would notice was that parts of my life looked richer so I would start to experience what I would call a rich life and that I was more present in the moment with my partner or when I was experiencing something joyful I would notice it more and that was um happening with this just setting the intent of that question but meanwhile there was still this growth going on and so although things were a little bit better because of my I guess the lens I was looking through there was still this other side of my life that was just not under control and then then I ran a live event webinar 
bang, which went really well. It was so fun. Um, but coming up to that, there was a lot of deadlines. Meanwhile, I'm still trying to get the best out of my new employee. And a lot of things fell apart during that because there was deadlines, you notice it because it's not as forgiving, right? <laughs> so there were lots of things that I wanted to happen in a set sequence that ended up not happening in that sequence. And it just, anyway, so then that reached a critical mass where in that week, I just, I think the 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 thing that came up to my mind with, with the meltdown and I was in tears, I was like coaching at Dear Darling and I was in tears and I was like, I can't rely on anyone. It's official. If you have to do something, you have, if you want something done, you have to do it yourself. And I had this big, massive meltdown and all the tears and all the things. And it all reached this massive, like, I guess, a head. It all came to a head where I just thought, that's it. I give, I give up. <laughs> I give up. Um, and, and then from there, after that meltdown is when the good stuff happened. It wasn't even necessarily conscious, but it's like I just had to experience the complete unraveling of myself and I guess we'll probably unpack in a tech because I'd love to explore this with you because I haven't actually had a good think about how all the things led to where they are now. But that was maybe a couple of weeks ago that that meltdown happened. And now I have noticed that I am like chill. Like I am different. I am letting go of things. I'm not as stressed about things. I make different decisions to make sure that I'm not stressed about things. And it's it's like, I don't exactly know all the little steps from there, but all I know is that the, the process of going through that and having this extra person come into my life was definitely the catalyst for getting to the other side and I truly, in the last week or so, and it's only been a week or so, maybe we'll have a relapse, you know, these things happen. But <laughs> but I do feel like I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I feel like I'm living it. I feel like I, I'm i different. I have changed. I can just, I can feel this internal shift. And I'm sure other, I'm sure you listening at home can relate to times like this where you've had that kind of shift, where you've gone through something hard and you get out the other side and you're just, you're literally different and you're kind of bulletproof in a different way from where you were when you started the journey so it has shifted and it has changed and I'd, I'd be super keen to hear your perspective back on what what you see happening and because I feel like there'll be so much to learn from that for everyone listening and it's very clear from your story that you know circumstantially in in your situation your surrounding your environments actually not very much has changed you know, you still have the demands of, you still have the same clinical work. You have even greater demands in your business. You have still enormous goals in your business that you haven't yet achieved. And that kind of, that, that um, wanting to, to do more. And you still have this employee or contractor to manage. You still have all the same, let's call them stressors, things that would, would for anybody create stress but also in particular for you this past version of yourself were creating a lot of stress and were making you not enjoy your life and so to me I look at this and I'm like fascinated by what changed in your mindset and your nervous system and Christine's humbly said you know I didn't didn't do anything consciously to change this but Clearly, there are there there are things that she's been exposing herself to. She's, there's been different thought processes and belief systems that she's been trying on, even though it didn't feel particularly calculated or difficult. Her mind has been going to work on how can we solve this problem? How can we stay in this situation and keep moving forwards without having to fire somebody or quit my business or downgrade my business, have less demand or leave my clinical job, which all feel like, you know, I'm sure back then in this, in the thick of this, they felt like the only way that anybody could possibly survive this situation. So I, I can't wait to unpack this a bit more. And I just want to, you know, you said so many things that are so relatable to any clinician in, um, in who, who might be listening beyond what I just mentioned. But, you know, the line that you said that really stuck out was, if you want something done, you have to do it yourself. <laughs> that is a classic clinician thought, isn't it? Because the stakes are high. It's important that we do everything right. And if we can't 100% trust people to be able to outsource the work, then we really don't want to. And there's no shortage of 
you know, even senior consultants who were doing extra work. I actually just booked an appointment with an, a very experienced clinician and he was doing his own administration uh, because he wasn't able to rely on his administration staff. So, you know, I, I think this challenge comes up for clinicians at all levels with all different staff, whether it's administration, allied health, other colleagues, it's a very common problem for us. So basically, you know, and I think the first thing to say is there are challenges that don't give anything back. I don't believe that all suffering and all challenges necessarily offer something. But it's it's clear in Christine's case here that this was a challenge that was offering her growth. So the first thing is to identify, you know, is this suffering, is this challenge, does it have something to offer me here? Because there's no point in suffering and we're definitely not encouraging suffering for the sake of it. Um, so be careful to identify that first. But once you've identified that you're potentially in this growth phase, in this transition phase, you find yourself on the floor in tears or wherever you're at, activated nervous system. And essentially the assessment by your mind is, this is hard or, and things aren't going well. And you said that yourself, Christine, you said a lot of things fell apart. You had that, that recognition, that thought about your situation where things were falling apart. And this is the, this is the tears moment, isn't it? Where it feels like I'm putting in all this effort and nothing's working. And I can relate to that too. Like my situation was, I feel like I'm doing everything that I know I can do and it's not working. I'm working hard and I'm trying to work intelligently and yet I'm not working. It's, it's not working. And the defeated feeling that comes with that after investing all that effort, you're spending all that effort, feeling like you're doing it really strategically, the despair that comes with, I feel like I've done everything. I've given everything. I don't even know what to do next. Perhaps nothing will work. That is a, that's a tears on the floor <laughs> moment. Now, we have that first thought. We assess the situation and we think some version of it's not hard and things aren't going well. And then we interpret that. The next thing that happens is our mind can interpret it with sentiments that you mentioned earlier as well, like, ah, maybe I took on too much here. Maybe actually I'm just not the kind of person who can manage all of these things. Or I'm not ready. Like maybe I took this on too early and maybe I should have waited a couple of years. Maybe I'll be the kind of person in so, so many years. And these are the thoughts that can have you exit situation earlier. As opposed to Christine's thoughts, which must have been something along the lines of, there's something for me to learn here. There's skills for me to build here. There is more that I can do here and I can work out what that is. I don't know it right now, clearly. <laughs> that's, that's kind of where all that pain comes from. I'm like, I don't know what the next step is. And if I stay here, I can work it out. The cost is I have to stay in this discomfort. So that's they're kind of the first like broad overview um, thoughts that I want us to bring our attention to when we're in these situations. Often it, it feels so bad, not because the situation is actually so dire, not because your business has collapsed and you've actually already experienced or realized some loss or that, you know, that your clinical care actually suffered or that you'd become unwell in the process. Like nothing bad had actually happened, but your mind was worried that it wouldn't be able to work it out. And something resourceful happened in you with your mind in this time where you decided, no, no, I can work it out. I'm going to stay the course to work it out. You recognize this is not a problem of you not being ready and therefore you should exit. And it's not a problem of you taking on too much. The problem was you needed new skills and new mindsets to be able to be the person who can stay and work it out. 
Does that resonate with you, Christine? It really, really does. And and that was one thing I was really determined to push. I, want, I don't want to say push through in a bad way, but like you said, there was there's obviously options where maybe not in the situation I was in because I was kind of locked into a contract with this new hire. So I, you know, I was kind of locked in financially. So that was that. But I guess um, there are other situations where you might be able to just quit or exit or, you know, those kind of things. But um, I did feel a little bit tied in. But where I guess I could swap this person for another person, I chose not to do that. I chose not to do that because I, I think there was a part of me that was so aware that people need training when they start a new job. Like that's normal. Maybe my expectations were higher because I was at that place where I was just desperate for help. Like I just needed help yesterday. And then I was already sort of like just so expectant and hopeful that this would be like the answer to that. So I think my expectations were unfairly high. And for anyone, no matter what their skill set was coming in, it would have been very difficult to step into the shoes that I wanted them to fill, which was just to like make my life better, basically. Do you know what I mean? So it, it was, when you think back on it, it sounds funny for me to say it out loud, but I was serious at the time. I thought like, it's just, I don't know, it was a, it's a learning curve. Um, but in, in saying that, like the solution was actually less rather than more. Like I actually made the decision to hit the pause button for like uh just to, I needed to get through my live event my webinar because my nervous system was already like I need that to be lovely for my live event so I was like and that's enough for my nervous system this week so I actually hit the pause button with that after the meltdown and then picked things up but in that I also made the decision that I was going to do things so differently like so just in terms of how I was going to work with this person I was only going to see them twice a week rather than every day I was going to change the way we did our meetings like there were so many solutions that came from that but it wasn't just that that was kind of like the what's the saying the thing that broke the camel's back is that the, what do you know what I mean anyway is that the straw there was a straw that broke the camel's back yeah that was the thing that brought it all up to a head but that wasn't the actual problem overall the, the overall problem was a Christine problem that had been going on for years at this stage but what was really interesting was once I sort of adjusted to this this problem that that brought the meltdown on everything else got better so I was I was going into clinic completely relaxed to be there fully present like just you know what I mean it's it's it was interesting because it was like that represented everything and and when you say about um having that problem where uh you can't you feel you can't rely on anyone I think that must have been even a residual from being a doctor in training like that the the trauma that I carried from not being able to hand stuff over working too hard like even though this is about my business now that was also about past Christine and I never ever quite found the resolution to that I've always had trouble delegating in my clinical role because of the bad experiences I had when I was delegating and so it was just another forum of the same thing so I don't know how I'd be fascinated to hear your thoughts on this but how that that sort of taking yourself to the point where you're going through it, but something tips you over the edge. And it's something in that, like, I don't want to say rock bottom because it's a wee bit dramatic for what was the situation. <laughs> let's let's face it. But you know, that kind of rock bottomy vibe where you're just like, this has to be the line in the sand. Like it's you've just reached capacity of some sort. And then it feels like everything's broken or shattered. There's a shattering of reality, I guess. And I feel like if if I'm honest about it my perception of it now would be there was a shattering of reality and that reality was who I fundamentally was and she had to go like she was not my best friend like she <laughs> and I, I feel like with love I feel like I sort of lost parts of myself that like the hyper controlling unable to delegate person like now I'm delegating just I'm a lot more relaxed like with it like I just you know it's it's hard to explain I give it a lot more space and time I don't I don't want to control it I don't want to hold on to it I'm I'm just letting a lot of stuff go and it's happened very quickly since the shattering of myself I guess what do you think about that that's what's so powerful one of the really powerful things about the work that we do in Dare Darling is we give these thoughts that we have airtime because you know if of course, your mind would associate delegating and in particular delegating gone wrong, not being able to trust people, not be able to rely on people. Your mind's expected function would be to have saved that memory from this high stakes clinical situation where you chose to trust somebody 
and it ended up creating a bigger problem for you. Your brain's job is to save that memory, to tag that pattern and be like, do not do this again. This caused a major problem for us, so don't do it. And your brain doesn't consider the facts of the situation at hand. Your brain just looks for patterns. It would take too much cognitive processing power to look at the facts of the situation. And so while you might think that your mind is being really logical and rational as you're looking at this situation, which was with, you know, it was a different situation. Yes, it was high stakes because you care so much about serving the people in your business, but it was a different level of stakes to the clinical situation that you had in past where somebody could have been immediately and severely harmed. Unfortunately, your brain would likely have coupled those things together, made the association. This is relying on somebody else for something that's important to you. And then just seeing that pattern and being like, danger, danger, danger. We cannot do this. Everything's going wrong. We need to stop this process. This process isn't safe. And this is where coaching, which at its core is it's essentially effective, proactive reflection. It's, it's reflecting on yourself and your thought processes and how they affect your behavior and how they create your results in a way that is paired with making changes in your life. So reflection with an actual like, okay, what are we going to do differently? How do we want to update these models of the world? So as much as it doesn't feel like it might be important to to spend time focusing on what you could call an unimportant problem. My clients often come to me and they're like, oh, it's just not really a big deal. But, and it shouldn't be a big deal, they'll tell themselves. But you bring up the specifics of the situation. So you can see, you let your brain see, ah, this actually isn't the same as that situation back there. Sure, maybe I wouldn't choose to trust somebody in that situation again. Maybe I would make that decision. But for my brain to say these are the same situations and to use that heuristic of trust no one, that it's built from that pattern, you, you can be like, no brain, this, this is a different situation. So as much as it can seem like you don't actively make any changes, just this process of bringing things up and letting your brain decide on this situation in particular, it can break down those false associations and it can break down that erroneous pattern recognition and, and help you recognize, no, 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 my reaction to this situation, I don't want to have the same reaction. I'm, I don't, these are not the same situations as each other. They're different situations and hitting rock bottom. <laughs> and if you like, and allowing yourself to actually give that problem airtime you know, even if you say it's just a small problem, that's what actually gives you the chance to update those models of the world that your brain has built, to update that pattern recognition and be like, no, this is different. So I, I feel like you, you very humbly talk about how, you know, you didn't really do anything. You just, you know, it just, you know, with time things changed and I just started acting and feeling differently. But I know for a fact that you do things differently and it doesn't feel effortful. And I love that for you. But you're also even telling us about how you actively, you know, not only have you clearly changed your thought processes, you've changed your relationship with your emotional responses as well and that nervous system activation, but you also made some very clear logistical changes because you brought up this situation, you looked at it in detail, you let yourself hear all of the challenges and the struggles of it in completeness, and then your brain got to work on like solution, 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 solution. So I just, I really want to give you more credit in this situation because it's also very easy to keep this situation in your mind and just have it loop over and over and over and stay with those same erroneous pattern recognition challenges that our mind has. You know, I keep doing this reflective coaching work myself because I know I've still got a lot of patterns in there that I want to update. I have different models of the world that I want to update. This is my process for doing it. So yeah, they're my thoughts on it. I think that it actually was quite an active process and you really gave yourself the reflection that was required for you to make the skills 
not only the skills upgrades, but just the pattern recognition upgrades that your mind needed. Yeah. And I'm just having a massive aha moment there when you were saying that about rock bottom and airtime. And it felt like that seemed to be it. Like this, I have legit been struggling with this kind of problem this this sort of being torn in a million places feeling busier than I want to feel blah 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 blah, holding all the plates in the air and as much as I have acknowledged that that is a problem like this event that took me kind of over the edge of it gave it airtime it made me listen to it it made me think where to next because but I feel like I hadn't really maybe given it enough airtime or or I hadn't <laughs> I guess the airtime was maybe this means I have to quit my medical job or oh, that's a bit hard retreat retreat <laughs> no more airtime <laughs> do you know what I mean and that was never the solution anyway like I say now I'm sort of like I'm bouncing into clinic like living my best life and I now have this amazing person who now appears amazing to me and is actually helpful because my whole mindset is different to how I can let them help me. It's it's blown my mind. But my point is, I think it was such a profound realization when you said that that the 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 more severe the the <laughs> event that makes us grow or the more painful it is, it's probably the most accelerating because you're gonna be given all of those thoughts, allowing them to come up to the surface, giving it your time, and from there, like you say your subconscious mind your mind it just goes to work and you will come to a resolution whereas I feel like just looking back now I almost feel like did I need that to happen did I need to be taken over the edge to make it better or could I have at some earlier point actually just given it more airtime I don't know Beck but here we are. (laughs) Well there's actually a fundamental process that we think is key in these you know, I guess you could say across the board in a therapy and a therapy oid type interventions, um, reflective practices like coaching. Memory consolidation suggests that that emotional activation is key to being able to bring up those old memories. And that, that as I'm talking about those patterns, the patterns that your friends learn to recognize to actually bring them up and prompt them. And the emotional activation is the thing that gives you a chance to change them. Because before you've had the emotional activation, you can't see it clearly. You know, they talk about um, in the articles, you can find them on PubMed if you just search memory reconsolidation. They talk about um, some people have used the analogy of it being a zip file. So you've got all these, these patterns, pattern recognition stored in your subconscious memory. And your brain's like, it's got this file of like, trust no one. Like when when people don't fulfill what I ask them to do, then this is a bad threat and this is a big problem. So that file was activated and they talk about it being like a zip file. So by having the emotional experience of that come up for you again, that was stored away in your brain from the past, it gives you a chance to double click and open the zip file and actually see what is inside. And before that point, it's just stored away as a little heuristic of like, this equals this, which in this case, we can see it didn't actually apply to Christine's situation. That pattern recognition wasn't actually serving her in this situation. Not only did it not apply to the situation, but it was creating more of a stress response than she wanted when she actually wanted to learn to be more calm, confident, and in control, more unshakable in that process. And so the emotional activation, as much as the crying on the floor and hitting rock bottom feels like you're kind of doing it wrong in a way, it's possible that that is fundamental to this process of updating these models of the world that you are not otherwise aware of. You know how sometimes, and I guess this is the case with a lot of these, you have an emotional response to something that just feels out of proportion. And it can be hard to, you know, a lot of people experience that they they don't know what they're thinking. They just have this emotional response. And that's because your brain isn't having conscious thoughts. It's just perceiving a pattern. It's activating your nervous system. And then you have to sit with it long enough to be like, what's wrong? What's happening here? And to do that, you need to be able to sit with the emotion. So there is some science or theory behind, you know, why this rock bottom experience and why these emotions are actually not only common in these processes, but actually fundamental to actually making changes. The papers agree that fundamental to memory reconsolidation, to updating those zip files 
is the emotional activation. And I don't think there are many, if I could say any coaching sessions that I've ever given where I don't ask people to feel and allow the emotion in their body because of that. Yeah. So I think there's something special in that process. And if you're somebody who tends to avoid their emotions, then it's really worth um, considering how that might be the next step for you, the next next piece to unlock, ironically, the most logical, rational, aligned and valued-based parts of your mind and to be able to not live by patterns and your brain's defaults. You know, this this process that we go through um, where we really, especially as clinicians, we want to avoid the emotional side of things um, and we really panic when we feel like we're failing or we're not managing things well. It shows us how how much so many of us really do struggle with the growth mindset. Truly, I think a lot of us believe that we have a growth mindset because we believe if we work hard, we'll succeed. If we work hard, we'll get smarter, we'll get better. We, we all nod our heads and agree with that. But I think your growth mindset's really revealed when you're on the floor crying, when things aren't going well. What are your thoughts in that moment? That's the time where we see, do you actually have a growth mindset? Or do you believe because things aren't going well right now that you're never going to be able to work it out? And Christine's just given us, you know, some, we probably don't have time for it this episode, but I just, I just want to crack open Christine's mind right now and be like, what were you thinking in those moments where it all looks so bad because we've all been there like when your mind's catastrophizing I'm sure you know it did that along the way and my mind still does that too but the difference is Christine got her brain back on board she allowed herself to feel the emotions to persist and then at some point she swapped into that growth mindset mode we're not just one or the other in or out but we we can swap it's a mindset you swap in and out of the growth mindset and she got herself into the growth mindset and she let herself feel all the, those emotions so that she get all the information. So I just, I think, Christine, you've, you've been incredibly skillful here and we haven't had enough time to explore the thoughts, but we will definitely do that because I need to know. I want to put these in the Dare Darling thought wardrobe so that everybody can enjoy these incredible growth mindset thoughts that you have. And for you guys who are, who are listening right now and going through something really hard for you guys who are in it, I really want you to think about, you know, yes, allow those thoughts that create the despair, the disappointment, the fear to come up. That emotional activation is useful. And also search your mind, step back from the situation, search your mind for the thoughts that you know are true about how these challenges are the only way for you to upskill the Revealing the skill gap, getting to an obstacle is the only way that you will learn to overcome the obstacle. And, and a joy ride, on a joy ride, you don't learn any new skills. On an obstacle course, you grow stronger. You learn new strategies. You learn new skills. So you can have both. You can switch in and out of the mindsets, but take a little page from Christine's book and recognize that when you start to think about the situation differently without changing the situation, you can gain so much and get the outcome that you want. I love that so much, Beck. And yeah, we should we should totally unpack it in a future episode. But I'm just the irony is not lost on me of what you were saying that the so fascinating that in order to process these things, you need to feel the emotion to go through the transformation. <laughs> but I feel like in that moment. I, I just didn't want to feel that way anymore. Like the emotion came up and I felt it and I didn't really like it. And then it made me want to change. <laughs> the emotion was the motivation. I wanted to get away from the emotion. And I just think that's highly ironic and also amusing. So thank you so much to everyone for listening. I hope that you are um, happy and not going through it. But if you are, just, just know that you'll get to the other side and your little subconscious mind will be working on amazing solutions and and it's going to unlock a whole new you so thank you so much and we'll see you in the next one <laughs> bye i've been waiting all my life for something i've been down the darkest roads and up in the clouds but i've always felt that something's missing